Daniel Colwell, 110 pound fullback, 80 yards on the first play from scrimmage for a touchdown. He was a promising young football star, a small town favorite son. He was a good, kind man, and he was a brilliant athlete. He had a tremendous future. But Daniel Caldwell descended into madness and committed murder. I can laugh with you and love you, but I can still be a cold-blooded murderer, which I, I'm both. I'm good and I'm bad. His bizarre motive to commit suicide by execution. Mr. Caldwell is an intelligent person who did something that no one else in their right mind, it seems, would do. He chose to kill two people in order to reach the electric chair. If I, Daniel Caldwell, did the maximum crime, then I must pay the maximum fine. The system simply is afraid of the Daniel Caldwells. We simply do like we did, you know, 100 years ago, lock them up or kill them. October 9th, 1998, in the Sumter County Courthouse in America's Georgia, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and spectators are confronted with a tragic display as 37-year-old confessed murderer Daniel Caldwell takes the stand. Solomon swear the testimony you're about to give. Jurors do not make something so simple so hard. I, Daniel Caldwell, deserve the death penalty. Long plagued by schizophrenia and manic depression, he makes a case to the jury not to save his life, but to have it taken away. How do you know that I will not break out of prison or escape from prison and then I torture your loved ones, such as your children, parents, or whoever you love deeply, even yourself? In the end, the court is left with a haunting question. Would sending Daniel Caldwell to the electric chair be a punishment or a reward? It began in 1996 in the town of Americus. Population, 17,000. Americus is a deep south city, 140 miles due south of Atlanta. It's the heart of the old south. I really felt like America's was a, a very nice, warm place. You know, like any town, it has its ups and downs, it has its crime. On the evening of July 20th, the America's police received an emergency call. Two people had been shot in front of the local Walmart. Every officer on duty headed to the scene. Minutes later, a man walked into the police station. He calmly told the receptionist that he had come to turn himself in for the murders at Walmart. Commander Nelson Brown was called back from the crime scene to handle the situation. When he arrived, he saw that the man was Daniel Caldwell, a friend and former local football star. Brown had known Caldwell for years, but when he started talking to Daniel, he found his composure unnerving. His demeanor was was calm, but he was like a person or uh, possessed, and he was either on a mission or had completed a mission. Brown would soon find out that, in fact, Daniel had completed a mission. After reading Caldwell his rights, the officer proceeded to take his statement. Now I to myself. Caldwell calmly recounted what had happened in the days leading up to the crime. He said that on Thursday, July 18th, two days prior to the shootings, he had purchased a 9mm gun. Caldwell then bought ammunition at Walmart, drove to the nearby Skyland Motel, and checked in, intending to kill himself. I bought the gun to commit suicide, but I didn't have the nerve to pull the trigger, so 
With that morbid thought in mind, Caldwell said he drove to the Walmart on Saturday. Did you go out to Walmart for any particular purpose to commit a crime? He waited outside his car, coldly weighing the best way to achieve his ultimate objective. First, he needed at least two victims. Second, they had to be white. I just want to make sure it was white, so I'll be sure I get the literature. You know, if you kill some other black, they may not give me the literature for that. After dismissing black and Hispanic shoppers, Caldwell said he saw a young white woman with two children leave the store, but rejected her as well. I didn't want to kill the lady, really, because she had a family. She was still young. Then, an older white couple stopped to chat with a young woman. 57-year-old Mitchell Bell and his 52-year-old wife, Judith, had been shopping for curtains for their new home. The Bells fit Daniel Caldwell's profile. I walked up to the man and put a gun out and fired to him in his back. And he said, please let me live. I do anything this people that can kill. And then I shot him in the head. Caldwell was not finished. And the other lady, she fell to the ground, and they gave me a piece of shot to shoot her too. As the two lay bleeding on the sidewalk, he calmly walked to his car, drove to the police station, and turned himself in. Commander Brown gave Caldwell the opportunity to add any final statements. Mitchell Bell had been pronounced dead in the Walmart parking lot. His wife Judith died at Sumter Regional Hospital that night. Five months later, Daniel Caldwell was indicted on 13 counts related to the murders, eight of which carried the death penalty. Caldwell seemed to be on the road to achieving his goal, ending years of depression and delusion with a suicidal trip to Georgia's electric chair. Michael Mears is the director of Georgia's multi-county public defender's office. He became Daniel Caldwell's lead counsel. First time I met Daniel, he was chained to a chair. He had shackles on both feet. He had shackles on his arms. He had his uh, biceps chained to a chair. And there were three armed guards standing around us. And he smiled at me. And first thing he said, I want to die. I don't want to live, I want to die. Caldwell's case would present his attorneys with a challenge they had never faced before, preparing a defense for a client who didn't want one. Their first task, to trace Daniel Caldwell's descent from hometown hero to suicidal murderer. Through interviews, medical records, and consultations with psychologists, the defense team pieced together a history of Daniel's mental illness, an illness that went undetected for years. Daniel Morris Caldwell was born on February 16, 1961, the 11th of 14 children in a family that had lived in Sumter County for four generations. His father, Bowman Caldwell, was a retired construction worker. His mother, Ella May, worked as a nanny and housekeeper. Mr. and Mr. Caldwell are those type of people that uh, in the African-American community would be Norman Rockwell's picture of America. They gave their children a loving and devoutly religious home. What they instilled in us was our respect for people. A respect for the law, 
and our respect for God and church, and they taught us to work hard. Daniel was a rambunctious child. At age seven, he fell out of a tree, an accident that left a large and permanent bump on the back of his head and possibly caused long-term brain damage. At the time, though, Daniel seemed fine. As a husky teenager, he played football at America's High School, carrying on a family tradition. Most of the boys in the family played football in high school. Daniel was one of the most popular players. On the field, he was an aggressive running back, an excellent player who loved the game. Off the field, Caldwell had a reputation as a nice guy and was well liked by his classmates. Sissy Bowen remembers Caldwell as a gentle jock who helped her when she was picked on by some boys at school. He stepped in between me and the, on all these guys and he said, Sissy, you all right? And he picked up my books for here for, for me and handed them to me and he said, don't mess with Sissy. During his senior year in 1979, Caldwell led America's high school to an undefeated season, becoming a local hero in the process. College recruiters took notice of the 210-pound, six-foot-one running back. But during that year, Caldwell began telling friends that his priorities were changing. He told his coaches that he wanted to devote more of his energies to his faith. Caldwell, along with his siblings and his mother, began attending a new church, known today as First Albany Deliverance Cathedral about 40 miles south of Americus. Among other strict rules, the church taught that football was in fact sinful. The teaching was that playing football was violent and harmful to your body, and that your body should be a vessel for God. And so to play football would be to damage the vessel. I do think he struggled with that thought because he loved football. But Daniel Caldwell was dealing with more than this conflict over his religious beliefs. He was also facing the beginnings of serious mental illness. It's really hard to pinpoint this is the day it started. I think the symptoms came on, and they often do, sort of slowly. Karen Bailey Smith examined Caldwell's history of mental illness before his trial. She and forensic psychologist Daniel Grant who spent more than 20 hours interviewing Caldwell for the defense team, would later learn that the first manifestations of his illness came sometime during his high school years, when he began to suffer terrifying hallucinations. Daniel had told me that even when he was in high school, that he was having some visions where he would look in the, in the, turn around and look in the back of the school, in the classroom, and see the gates of hell open. He said that was very vivid. Caldwell kept these visions to himself, and though still deeply conflicted, he continued to play football. In 1979, he won a football scholarship to Western Arizona Junior College. Daniel Colwell, 210-pound fullback, 80 yards on the first play from scrimmage for a touchdown. He eventually transferred to Middle Tennessee State University. There, Colwell became close friends with fellow football player Jeff asked. I used to call him the gentle giant because sometimes I'd say, gosh, how does this guy be so gentle and just so peaceful almost, but then go out and brutalize people on the football field? I mean, he would physically run over people and enjoy it. By 1983, Caldwell's senior year, he was once again attracting attention, this time from NFL scouts. But Daniel's deepening mental illness ended his chances. He would later explain that just before kickoff in a late season game, he had heard the voice of God. The voice told him that he should not abuse his body anymore, that he should quit playing football. Caldwell walked off the field, never to return. Just a semester shy of graduation, he was forced to move back to his parents' home in Americus, where he got a job as a prison guard. 
At that point, some in town began to notice changes in Daniel. And at times, he would seem like he was sort of like in a world of his own. When you bypass him or see him somewhere, he was just like he was in a trance, like he was somewhere other than here in America's his hometown. In February 1986, Caldwell sought treatment. He decided to go to Los Angeles, where he was sure no one back home would find out. There, he checked himself into a mental hospital. He was diagnosed as depressed and prescribed medication. After a few days, he went back home to Americus and told no one what he had done. Six months later, Caldwell was the best man in the wedding of his college friend, Jeff Ast. I would like to toast uh, for and to Jeff and Laurie Ast and to wish them the best today and forever. To the groom, Caldwell seemed like his usual self. He was a little more quiet, but I, had a, I, I just took it upon it because he just really didn't know anybody. And so he was kind of like fish out of water, so to speak. But I mean, pretty much the same Daniel. Yet despite Caldwell's outward calm, his life remained in turmoil. In 1987, he decided to make his faith his career by joining the ministry. He traveled to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to work with televangelist Jimmy Swaggart, whom he had admired since high school. All of us have sinned. Just a few months after Caldwell's arrival, Swaggart's ministry exploded in a scandal over his dalliance with a prostitute. Caldwell was in the audience when Swaggart publicly confessed. To the rest of the world, the Swigert confession was the climax of a lurid tabloid scandal. But in the fractured mind of Daniel Caldwell, Swigert's downfall took on a momentous significance. It really hurt him because he had high regards for Mr. Swigert. I guess that was devastating to him. So at that point, he turned bitter towards religion. Almost overnight, the scandal turned Caldwell from a fundamentalist Christian to a self-proclaimed and increasingly vocal atheist. Some say it also marked a turning point in his illness, one that could have led him to suicidal depression. He told me on several occasions that he felt tormented, that he was in constant pain, that he felt like he was carrying the weight of the world, and that if there was truly a God, that God would let him die, he felt that only through death could he find peace. By the summer of 1989, Daniel Caldwell was unemployed and living with his parents in America's Georgia. The 28-year-old was suffering from severe mental illness, which was growing worse by the day. Caldwell had been a devout Christian. He now claimed to be an atheist, though he often heard the voice of God and was plagued by vivid hallucinations revolving mostly around religion. When the mental illness becomes evident, you see that religiosity mixed in there. Where it actually turned over to mental illness, it's not clear, but it may be that when mental illness became full-blown, a lot of his religious beliefs became something he was very vocal about in a more delusional tone. Though he had hidden his problems from his family and friends, Caldwell's illness would soon become public, and his behavior would cross the line from odd to criminal. On August 14th, Caldwell walked into the lobby of WALB-TV in nearby Albany, armed with a toy gun and a kitchen knife. He would later say that he was following a command from God, who had come to him in a dream. Once at the station, Caldwell demanded airtime to espouse atheism. He wanted to go on the air during the noon news and talk about the problems of Christianity and that what he had come to believe at this point in his life, that um, there was no hell, that, um, that people who were Christians were just going the wrong way. Caldwell never became violent and offered no resistance when police arrived. He was arrested 
and charged with terroristic threats and acts. After pleading guilty, Caldwell was placed on probation and entered the state mental health system. Georgia state doctors diagnosed Caldwell with paranoid schizophrenia, a mental illness marked by delusions and hallucinations. During this time, Caldwell's brother noticed that his condition seemed to grow worse. After he began treatment, I saw him as being very, very depressed. I would go talk to him. I would try to inspire him to get up. Other family members would also talk with him and try to inspire him to be more active. He wouldn't respond. He was deeply depressed. When Caldwell's depression did lift, it would be replaced by a period of erratic behavior, which led to even more bizarre episodes. He stood in the street and directed traffic, even laying down in traffic in hopes of being run over by a car. He engaged in frantic writing campaigns, sending incoherent letters to everyone from Donald Trump to an unborn fetus. He wrote letters to people all over the world, and he was often on the envelope, he had a symbol that he would use, and then he would, around the symbol he would write, proud atheist showing his wrestling with religion. Caldwell's schizophrenia, it turned out, masked a second mental illness, manic depression. But his medication, which Caldwell himself was responsible for taking, was not alleviating those symptoms. His lack of improvement left his family feeling helpless. We didn't know that there was anything else to do since we could not go down physically with him and participate or actually speak with his doctor about what was going on. Daniel was like most poor people in Georgia and I would say across the country who get thrust into an overworked, underpaid mental health system. He was simply given a pill, told to come back later on, and we'll continue. While his suicide attempts and manic behavior continued, Caldwell's only regular treatment remained outpatient visits to the local mental health clinic. Caldwell rarely saw the same doctor for an extended period of time, eventually visiting at least eight different doctors in four different facilities over the next few years. With resources in the state mental health system so limited, no doctor ever had a chance to monitor Daniel's progress over an extended period. That was totally inadequate for Daniel. And because the mental health system failed for a lot of different reasons, Daniel never received the type of medication, the type of, of counseling, the type of treatment that he would have received had he had the money to go to a private psychiatrist or psychologist and be properly treated. Meanwhile, Caldwell's condition continued to worsen. In September 1992, he came up with two desperate plans, plans he hoped would result in his own death. Both involved Millard Fuller, founder of the charitable organization Habitat for Humanity and America's Georgia's most famous resident. Caldwell decided he would either hold Fuller hostage in exchange for a ransom, drugs he could use to kill himself, or kill Fuller in order to get the death penalty. But Fuller learned of the plans from a friend of Caldwell's and reported the threat to police. And immediately they told me they knew Daniel Colwell. They said he's well known in the police department because he's done some strange things. So I asked, I said, do you think he's dangerous? They said, we don't know. He's never harmed anybody, but we don't know. Police went to the Colwell home and found Daniel with a gun and a letter detailing his intentions. He was arrested and again charged with terroristic threats. On December 8, 1992, Caldwell pleaded guilty and was sentenced to five years in jail. Daniel Grant evaluated Caldwell behind bars in 1993. At that time, you know, he told me about where he had been having problems with, you know, hearing voices. He was having some problems with delusional thoughts. Caldwell was released in April of 1995 on the condition that he continue outpatient treatment at Middle Flint Behavioral Health Care. 
Over the previous six years, Caldwell had been arrested at least twice, spent over two years in jail, and attempted to kill himself at least three times. His treatment had not helped his suicidal impulses. We talked to Daniel about that, and he said, although some symptoms went away and things at different points might have been better, he never lost that feeling that he wanted to die. According to medical records, Caldwell was discharged from treatment on July 18, 1996. Just two days later, Caldwell staked out a Walmart parking lot and gunned down Judith and Mitchell Bell in cold blood. Anytime you hear of an incident like that, you feel sick inside, but we felt doubly sick because Daniel had done it. We had thoughts of why didn't we see this coming? Was it our fault? Caldwell was hoping for the death penalty his reason for committing the murders in the first place. The state of Georgia was also hoping for the death penalty. Only his defense team, led by Michael Mears, hoped his life would be spared. It's against the law to assist in the suicide of a person here in Georgia. And we were taking a position that Daniel wanted us to violate the law, he wanted the court to violate the law by assisting in his suicide. Assistant District Attorney Daniel Bibler, however, saw Colwell as a cold-blooded killer who deserved the strongest possible punishment. The term came up in the trial about state-assisted suicide. Well, this, this wasn't a case about trying to get Daniel Colwell what he wanted. It was a case about punishing Daniel Colwell as society says he's authorized to be punished for what he did. Both sides agreed that Colwell was mentally ill, but that had no bearing on the legal question Colwell now faced. Was he competent to stand trial. That decision would be made by a jury, which would evaluate Caldwell based on the state's three-part definition of competency. In Georgia, in order to be competent to stand trial, all that has to happen is that you have to understand the nature of the charges against you. You have to understand the penalty that can be imposed if you're found guilty of those charges, and you have to know what your lawyer is. Caldwell's competency trial began before Judge Rucker Smith on April 20th, 1998, at the Sumter County Courthouse in Americus. State forensic psychologist Karen Bailey Smith was brought in by the judge to evaluate Caldwell's condition. She diagnosed him as suffering from severe depression and psychosis. We did see some indications of problems in thinking. We saw a little bit of delusional thoughts, which are false beliefs. And um, he had reported at some points in time having hallucinations. In the end, Bailey Smith's report said that Caldwell was indeed competent to stand trial. But the psychologist did not take a position as to whether he should stand trial. The report concluded, quote, whether a defendant can choose to forego a defense in order to bring about his own demise is a legal question. My testimony was basically, he can do everything that a defendant needs to do. So it was the jury's decision to decide if you have all the skills but choose not to use them, can you still be competent? After two days of testimony from Bailey Smith and other doctors, the jurors began their deliberations. They came back with their verdict less than two hours later. They found Daniel Caldwell competent to stand trial. At that point, Caldwell controlled his case. Um, he had the right to make whatever decisions he wanted to. Caldwell's defense attorneys now figured they had weeks to prepare for arraignment. They expected to enter a plea that could spare their client the death penalty. What would have been preferable, given all of the evidence that we had at our disposal at that time, would have been to file not guilty by reason of insanity. But that very afternoon, Daniel Caldwell returned to Judge Smith's courtroom, where he was told by the judge that he now controlled his case and could plead guilty if he wished to do so. After taking less than an hour to consider his options, Caldwell pleaded guilty to the murders of Judith and Mitchell Bell. Are you entering that plea freely and voluntarily? Yes. Is anybody forcing you or making you plead guilty in any way? Yes. Now there would be no trial and no opportunity for Caldwell's attorneys to raise other defenses. His case would go straight to the sentencing phase. 
Opening statements in Caldwell's sentencing hearing began before a new jury on October 5, 1998. Reporter Sissy Bowen, a high school classmate of Caldwell's, covered the hearing for the America's Times recorder. She says defense attorney Michael Mears faced an uphill battle. He didn't have the support of his client, nor did he have any kind of uh, help from the judge because the judge was bound by this competency hearing to allow Daniel to do and say what he needed to say in his own defense, which was a non-defense. It was a bizarre, surreal experience to watch that happen. The attorney's goal was to save his client from the air, even if that conflicted with his client's wishes. Mears argued with Judge Smith over who should be making decisions for the defense and why. I will not participate in Mr. Caldwell's defense to seek this death penalty. That is a horror to the law. It is a horror to my moral obligation. I understand your moral obligations. Well, I'm not, we're not talking about your moral obligations. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the law. I will leave the case. But before I... No, sir, you're not leaving the case. Well, before I assist him in getting the death penalty, I'll turn to my boss on it. No, sir, I'm asking you to do as your client wishes. The fact that the defense attorney disagrees with what the, uh, what the client wants to do may be a problem for the defense attorney, but it's not a problem for the court. We kept saying, you can't have a mentally ill person making those types of decisions. That's why you have lawyers. If you're not going to let us be lawyers, then let us go. On October 9, 1998, at the Sumter County Courthouse in Americus, Georgia, Daniel Caldwell took the stand in his own sentencing hearing. He had pleaded guilty to two murders, crimes he said he had committed in hopes of ending his life in the electric chair, crimes he now said in open court he would repeat if given the chance. I'm going to scheme to get the job done, which is murdering again. Clearly, he's a dangerous man, and I don't think anybody in the courtroom questioned that. I just think that there were those that thought he's a horrible, dangerous man that needs to burn in hell, and there were those that thought he's incredibly dangerous, but he's sick. Caldwell was now being medicated for schizophrenia and manic depression. The medication, however, did not curb his suicidal tendencies. On the stand, he made his goals perfectly clear. Plan A is simply to get the jury to give me the death penalty. Caldwell described himself as a monster with no control over his own impulses. I could be a murderer and be a good person. I mean, I could laugh with you and love you, but I could still be a cold-blooded murderer, which I, I'm both. I'm good and I'm bad. To juror Patricia Taft, Caldwell's bizarre behavior in court seemed like an act performed to get attention. A lot of people don't want to live, but they don't go out and, and kill other people to get their name in the paper, to get their face on TV. If he couldn't be famous with the football and the notoriety and all that, that he decided he was going to be infamous. The six foot one, 314 pound Caldwell issued many threats from the stand, but one stood out. It was directed specifically to members of the jury. How do you know? that I will not break out of prison or escape from prison and then I torture your loved ones such as your children, parents, or whoever you love deeply, even yourself. I had hope beyond hope, but once Daniel threatened the lives of the jurors, I was watching the jurors, scared these jurors death. I think from that point on, those jurors were clouded in their judgment about Daniel. On October 12, 1998, the case went to the jury. The next day, they returned with a verdict. Taft says that only the cold, hard facts of the case, a brutal, premeditated double homicide committed in a public place, played a role in the deliberations. My only concern was what was the correct thing to do with regards to the punishment for the crime he had committed. District Attorney John Parks read their decision. We recommend that Daniel Mars Caldwell be sentenced to death this 13th day of October 1998. Daniel's reaction was not unexpected. 
He was delighted. He was pleased. He had a smile on his face. He was the only one smiling in the courtroom that I recall. Um, love y'all. It's been fun. I'm going to go now to the pizza I've been looking for. Shortly after the verdict, Caldwell told his attorneys he wanted to celebrate the event with a steak dinner. Part of the reason why I found the way I did was because he said that given any opportunity, he will continue to kill people. In my opinion, there's a difference between mad and being bad. He was just a very bad person. We did not convince the jurors in the way that they should have been convinced. I'll take that guilt to my grave because I simply was not able to convince this jury that you don't have to be a blithering idiot to be mentally ill. Two days later, the judge formally announced the jury's finding. The court allowed Caldwell to make a final statement. In the surreal close to a tragic case, Caldwell chose to end his hearing not by giving a speech or an apology, but by singing a song by the rock group Styx. Just want to say goodbye forever to my home. Babe, I'm leaving. I must be on my way. The time is growing near. Please believe me, my heart is in your hands. I'll be missing you. Babe, I love you. Daniel Caldwell had finally gotten what he wanted, a death sentence. He was sent to George's death row in Jackson, about 50 miles southeast of Atlanta. After being sent to death row, Colwell repeatedly changed his mind about wanting to die. His family believed those changes had to do with the medications he received in prison. He deserved to get the best of treatment available for what his condition is. He has never gotten that. He has never gotten that. I believe if he gets that, he will want to live. He'll feel that he wants to live. He wants to live. He has said so. Sometimes he say he doesn't. It's a struggle. Colwell's death sentence, though, did not answer the troubling question his case provoked. Would the state be giving a sick man what he wanted? Or a convicted killer what he deserved? It really doesn't matter what Daniel Colwell wants. What matters is that he killed the Bells in cold blood. And if he did it because he says he wants the death penalty, it's irrelevant to me. This man was competent, he knew what he was doing, and now people want to say he didn't have the right to make the decisions that he made because he was mentally ill. But Daniel Colwell's defenders claim that he was as much a victim as a villain, the product of a criminal justice system poorly equipped to deal with the mentally ill. Our criminal justice system deals with mentally ill people out of a sense of fear rather than a sense of protectiveness and treatment. We need to be trying to treat and, and, and provide for the medical needs of mentally ill people, not housing them in prison and putting them on death row. It concerns me, honestly, how many cases there are like this. We do things according to the letter of the law, but maybe it's time for us to be looking at, at the law. Colwell's supporters acknowledged the horrific nature of his crimes, but said they were a result of a diseased mind, not a depraved mind. And they wondered why the community didn't feel the same way. Daniel was friendly to everybody, polite. To turn their backs on him when he gets sick is very disappointing. It's very disappointing. If Daniel were sitting on the ledge of a building in downtown Americas, threatening to jump off, Every member of that community would be down there trying to save him. But why, now that Daniel is trying to kill himself through the electric chair, why isn't anyone coming to his help? In January 2003, after being taken off suicide watch, Colwell hanged himself in his prison cell.
Daniel Colwell, 110 pound fullback, 80 yards on the first play from scrimmage for a touchdown. He was a promising young football star, a small town favorite son. He was a good, kind man, and he was a brilliant athlete. He had a tremendous future. But Daniel Caldwell descended into madness and committed murder. I can laugh with you and love you, but I can still be a cold-blooded murderer, which I, I'm both. I'm good and I'm bad. His bizarre motive to commit suicide by execution. Mr. Caldwell is an intelligent person who did something that no one else in their right mind, it seems, would do. He chose to kill two people in order to reach the electric chair. If I, Daniel Caldwell, did the maximum crime, then I must pay the maximum fine. The system simply is afraid of the Daniel Caldwells. We simply do like we did, you know, 100 years ago lock them up or kill them. October 9th, 1998, in the Sumter County Courthouse in America's Georgia, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and spectators are confronted with a tragic display as 37-year-old confessed murderer Daniel Caldwell takes the stand. Jurors do not make something so simple so hard. I, Daniel Caldwell, deserve the death penalty. Long plagued by schizophrenia and manic depression, he makes a case to the jury not to save his life, but to have it taken away. How do you know that I will not break out of prison or escape from prison and then I torture your loved ones, such as your children, parents, or whoever you love deeply, even yourself? In the end, the court is left with a haunting question. Would sending Daniel Caldwell to the electric chair be a punishment or a reward? It began in 1996 in the town of Americus. Population, 17,000. Americus is a deep south city, 140 miles due south of Atlanta. It's the heart of the old south. I really felt like America's was a, a very nice, warm place. You know, like any town, it has its ups and downs, it has its crime. On the evening of July 20th, the America's police received an emergency call. Two people had been shot in front of the local Walmart. Every officer on duty headed to the scene. 